grateful for the word that you have preserved for us. Uh, excited to uh, dig into the chapter of Mark, uh, looking at the uh, triumphant entry of Jesus into uh, Jerusalem. Um, and it's, it's a bittersweet chapter because uh, we see that even though the people shouted and sang his praises and celebrated, uh, he still wasn't received in the hearts of the people. He still wasn't received um, by the religious authorities there. And ultimately, he was rejected. God, we pray for uh, the return of Christ, where he will be uh, received by his church. He'll be welcomed and um, delighted to see him coming. And we pray for the world, um, those who still need to prepare themselves. Lord, we pray for salvation to spread uh, through uh, our uh, efforts of spreading the gospel, Lord. God, we want to lift up the many different prayer requests that have been mentioned today. We want to continue to remember our pastor and his wife as they travel, uh, just for safety for them. I uh, pray for uh, Caitlin. i uh, just very sorry to hear that she's in the hospital and uh, sounds like she's on uh, the road to recovery, but we just pray for uh, healing in her circumstance, Lord. Uh, we thank you for um, this uh, missionary brother that we have with us today. We just pray for the work uh, that he does. Uh, just the training and the support that they provide for missions, Lord. We lift all these things up to you, knowing that you're a God who hears, a God who blesses, um, a God who uh, cares intimately about each one of us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, been uh, studying Mark chapter number 11 in the uh, younger adults class. Uh, that we have back in the, the cafeteria, uh, starting through the book of Mark, and we've gotten to Mark chapter number 11. Uh, and as I said in my prayer, um, it is, uh, it's a bit of a bittersweet chapter. You know, it starts off with this very triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. He's kind of been making his way uh, down there for a little while. Um, and we already have some foreshadowing in the book that this is going to be an entry that comes with some conflict, right? Um, there's already been uh, Pharisees that have come from Jerusalem out to go and to find Jesus and to hunt him down and to kind of question and challenge him on his authority position. So we already have a bit of the sense that uh, there, uh, as I said, there might be some conflict when Jesus enters here. So let's jump in and see exactly what unfolds from this. Starting in Mark chapter number 11, verse number 1, it says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. And he saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man set, <coughs> sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do, you th do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where, where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said, Why, what, what do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the way. And they that went before, uh, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the, be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Looking at our first paragraph here, uh, speaking of this triumphal entry that Jesus had, it says, As Jesus approached Jerusalem, he sent disciples ahead to fetch a young donkey for him to ride, uh, to ride on. This was the fulfillment of the prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9, where it says, uh, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, but lowly and riding a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was simultaneously a humble and a royal event. While Jesus was riding on the animal of a poor commoner, the crowds were paving his way with their, with their coats, coats, excuse me, uh, shouting, Hosanna, save us, and praising God 
for the coming of his king and his kingdom. So again, it's a very interesting dichotomy that we have here, right? Uh, we have people that are uh, celebrating, that are praising, that are welcoming Jesus Christ coming. Uh, they uh, form a parade for him, right? And they're shouting, uh, Hosanna, save us, save us, save us, please save us. Uh, and shouting praise and saying, uh, you know, blessed is the one that the Lord has sent. Blessed is uh, the kingdom of our father David. And so there is this mentality of, of the Jewish people that, you know, now is the time. Now is the time of the king coming into his kingdom. This man is going to come and take what is rightfully his, to establish his throne, to restore Jerusalem to the order that uh, it rightfully had, um, you know, before years and years and years of servitude to other nations, to um, you know, falling before other nations. It's interesting, it even says they go and they, they gather palm fronds and spread it before his way. And then it even says that they grab uh, their garments, their coats. You know, their co they're throwing their coats before him so that his donkey can tread over him. Uh, you guys um, might remember, uh, for me, I've only ever seen it in movies. I've never seen it done in real life. Maybe you've seen it, uh, maybe you've experienced it. Uh, but, you know, you see in the movies where the gentleman will, you know, throw his coat over a puddle so that the lady doesn't have to walk through it, right? Um, and that's kind of the perspective uh, that, that we have. It's, you know, this, this is a king worthy of praise, you know. Uh, even his donkey's feet shouldn't have to touch the ground. Uh, and so people are, again, casting their coats. Uh, another thing worth pointing out, uh, coats weren't necessarily an easy thing to come by. Uh, you know, usually you had like one or two. Me, I hold jacket full of them, and I live in Florida. I don't wear half of them, right? Um, but for them, you know, this, this is a serious act of reverence is what I'm trying to get across, right? So these are people that obviously have some appreciation for who they think Jesus is. They have some reverence for who they think Jesus is. Uh, they have some expectation of the coming of the kingdom of God. They, uh, to some extent, desire it to happen, which brings us to a very important question. Um, I don't think I'm spoiling the story for anyone here. Uh, we know that in less than a week's time, Jesus Christ will be dead. Less than a week's time, Jesus Christ will be dead. And not only that, but the crowds will be clamoring for his death. They will be calling for his death. They'll be presented with the opportunity to free him or to free, uh, you know, a violent prisoner, an insurrectionist. And they will call for that man's freedom over Jesus Christ. So in less than a week's time, a very dramatic shift in the heart of the people, or at least in the, the expression of the people, takes place. And so my question is, the first thing I want us to talk about is why that happens. Um, the crowd called for salvation. That's what Hosanna means. It's save us, save us. They called for salvation, but ultimately they rejected the salvation that Jesus Christ offered. Why do we think that is? What what was difficult for them to grasp? Like, he wasn't saved. Mm. And and how he came to save? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So they they wanted a physical salvation. They wanted a physical redemption. They wanted a physical kingdom. They wanted. Um. They didn't want. New Jerusalem, they wanted old Jerusalem, right? And that's a very important distinction. Um, they wanted uh, Israel not to be um, a, a, a place that is fully surrendered unto God, right? A place fully devoted unto his worship, but they just wanted Israel to be returned to its former glory. Yeah, to be free from Roman rule. And uh, to be fair, uh, I, I, I think we could relate to that. Right? Uh, it's hard for us as a nation that um, you know, hasn't been conquered, that hasn't been governed right? uh, since we set free from England. Right? Uh, we have always been an independent people. Um, imagine the, the heart of the people if we were to be conquered by an outside force and what that would be like. Sure, we would clamor and we would desire this independence, but Jesus was offering them something greater, right? He was offering them something more, more than just a 
um, uh, a physical freedom and a physical salvation. Let's, let's follow that for a little bit, that train of thought. Um, is that something that people are still looking for today? Do we see people that come to Christ, um, or at least you know, say that are, they're coming to Christ, pursuing Christ, that are not looking for spiritual salvation, that they're not looking for regeneration of their heart, that they're not looking to be transformed from sinners into saints, into followers of Jesus Christ, but rather they're looking for the physical things that Jesus could provide for them. Yeah, we see head nod, nodding all around. Um, there's an entire you know, movement that is based around this, right? You know, we call it the prosperity gospel. Those who preach that um, the more faith that you have in Jesus Christ, the more that he will reward you here on earth. And, you know, if you're not driving a Benz, if you don't have a two-story house, right, if you don't have a 401k account that's full, um, then you just simply don't have enough faith in Jesus Christ. And if you'll give enough money to your pastor, uh, you know, that, that faith seed can grow. Um, there, it's dangerous. It's easy to point the finger in that. I also want to point out this, though, and I think it is worth, worth mentioning. Um, I hope no one sees this necessarily as a personal affront, uh, but one time I, was, uh, I heard a preacher speak one time, and it was very convicting unto me. He says, one of the things that I notice uh, most often when we're taking prayer requests, right, when we're having times of saying, um, what, what, what do we need to lift up unto God? You know, what do we need to pray for God to change? He says, we spend more time praying that God would keep saints out of heaven than that he would let sinners come to heaven, right? We spend more time praying for the healing and the physical healing of those who are already saved or those who are already following the Lord, you know, brothers, sisters, friends in Christ. And again, it's not that those things are bad to pray for. Like God offers healing and even miraculous healing. But where is the heart for the lost? That's also a very important component. And we, we need to have a heart that breaks and says, um, yeah, you know, the, I have a friend, I have a coworker, I have a neighbor, you know, I have a brother, I have a sister, I have someone that, that hasn't been saved spiritually, right? That has a greater need of healing than any physical healing could be. And we also need to be lifting them up and praying for them as well. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, I did a series a while ago on the way that Jesus teaches us to pray. One of the things that he teaches us to pray is, thy kingdom come. Again, how often do we pray, God, um, you know, there's so much that I want to do. Uh, you know, I, I'm getting to the point where I don't necessarily call myself a young man anymore, but I still feel young, right? I still uh, feel like I have a lot ahead. I feel like I have more ahead of me than I do behind me is what I'm hoping for. Um, and there are things that I want to do, you know. Um, I want to be a father one day. It's something that I would like to do. I want to be a pastor, like, uh, you know, to lead a church one day. Um, there are places I want to go and want to experience. Uh, I just got back from uh, 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Uh, I want to go to the 2020 uh, Summer Games and, and, and spread the gospel there. Like, there are things that I want to do, and all of us have these goals and ambitions. How often do we pray, nevertheless, you know, not my will, but thy will, God, um, I, would, I would trade it all if you would come today, right? I, I would trade it all if your kingdom was established today. Again, these, this should be our heart. And so we often pray, you know, God, save us. Save us from our affliction. Save us from our turmoil. Save us from what we're going through. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, but we have to be careful that our Hosanna uh, is, is greater, is more meaningful than the Hosanna that was offered here before Christ. As we continue on, uh, let's read verses 12 through 19. It says, And on the morrow, when they were hungry from Bethany, he was, uh, excuse me, when they were coming from Beth Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee there hereafter, forever and his disciples heard it now <clears throat> and they come to jerusalem and jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple over and over through the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple and he taught saying unto them is it not written my house shall be called an, of all nations the house of prayer 
but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. When even was come, he went out of the city. Going to our next paragraph on the paper, it says, When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, the first thing that he did was head to the temple and drive out the money changers and those selling animals for offering. Jesus accuses them of robbing those who came to worship, presumably through charging excessively for the currency and sacrifices required in the temple. The reference to the pigeon sellers being driven out shows that even the poorest people were being fleeced by these merchants. This radical action by Jesus earns him the hatred of the religious elite, and many believe this is the event that ultimately triggered Jesus' death. Okay, a couple interesting things to note, comments uh, to note here. So first we have this occasion where Jesus goes into the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers. He drives them out. Uh, John would say that he took the time to uh, weave uh, uh, cords together to make uh, a whip to chase them out, to drive them out of the temple place, right? And he says, you know, this is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. And this is the, the racket that they had going on here. Um, the, Jews, the Jewish temple, uh, this was the house of God, right? Um, and the last thing that they were going to do was take the currency of Rome that had the face of Caesar, who also proclaimed himself to be God. You know, in, in their minds, that, that's, that's as good as idolatry, right? And so they, they had a currency that was pretty much only used in the temple. It was, a t- it was a shekel that they had. And what you would do is you would come, and if you needed to make your offering, if you needed to pay the yearly temple tax, if you needed to uh, give money unto the temple, you would have to go and you'd have to take, you know, your Roman denarii, your Roman money, and you would exchange it for the shekel. Well, um, anyone who's ever done some international flying before, um, going to a foreign country, you know that usually comes with a cost. You know, it's not necessarily dollar for yen or dollar for won or dollar for peso or dollar for any amount that you get. Um, there is a cost for that exchange service. And so what was going on is that these uh, money changers were making a profit off of the required worship of the Lord, right? Um, So it would be as bad as, you know, if we had a price of admission for our church services every Sunday morning, right? It's like, um, you know, you can come in, um, you know, you can sit up front for $5, you can sit in the back for $25, right? Um, and we charge people uh, as, as they were coming through. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we, we would understand like that, that, that's a vile thing to do, right? They were profiting off what was required in worship, what was required in service. And then on top of that, he mentions uh, those selling the animals for offering. Um, again, uh, this was something that was, um, you know, required for the, the services was to make animal offer- offerings for all different manner of things. And, uh, you know, you've, you've uh, gosh, you go, you've gone to Disney before, you know, you've gone to an airport before, you've gone to anywhere where, like, once you get in there, you're kind of stuck. And then all of a sudden, the price of water goes from a dollar a bottle to, like, nine dollars a bottle, you know. Uh, when, once you're there, uh, they, they can jack it up because they, they got to keep you there. And so you have people that are literally traveling from all over the world to come and to make offering. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily easy to drive, you know, your herd or your flock uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Madrid, Spain, like some of the farthest reachings of Rome, all the way down to Israel. So the people would travel, and then once they were there, they would purchase their animal. And there was this incredible price hike on these animals that, again, were required offerings in the temple. What's yeah, the temple Seven Eleven? What is is probably the most heinous is that he references those who sold pigeons, and that 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 might be something you can kind of skip over. Um, But the offering of pigeons was actually an offering that um, was made specifically for the poor. Right. Um, it's it's there were offerings that if you couldn't afford, you know, a heifer, if you couldn't afford the animal that you had to offer, then you could make an offering of these pigeons and that would be acceptable unto God. And so for these even to be gouged up, these people were um, stealing with, with without. Let's just say they weren't Robin Hoods. Right. They weren't stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Uh, they were stealing to the poor and giving to the rich. You know, they were stealing from everyone who came around. And so we can understand 
that uh, Jesus, who uh, sees this as his father's house, right, that this is a house of prayer, that this is a place of worship, um, is infuriated by what's going on here. Um, I heard somebody say before, uh, anytime that, uh, you know, someone tells you, you know, what would Jesus do? Remind yourself that uh, getting a whip and turning over tables is one of those options uh, uh, in there. You know, Jesus was, was incensed and he drove these people out. And notice the attention of the people that he got. Um, it says in verse number 18, and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and immediately sought how they might destroy him, right? Um, their money-making operation was um, compromised by Jesus Christ. And this is, um, to, to my understanding, this is the, the, the domino that begins the chain of events that leads to the death of Christ. It's this event right here. Um, you know, several of the Gospels record this specific event that, that happened. We can see a lot of significance for this. And uh, I want to ask a question that is going to be challenging and might be something that some of us might not even be comfortable answering out loud, but I definitely think it's worth thinking about. Um, question number two is this. Jesus showed up to our church. Would he find something to drive out? I think that's an important question, right? Um, this is uh, a place, a congregation, a gathering of worship. For us, right? Uh, this is to be a place of prayer. This is to be a place where the praises of God are, are sung. Um, this is to be a place where God's name is lifted above everything else in our lives. And uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, if Jesus were to show up, right, uh, in the flesh, uh, what, what would his response to that be? What would that look like here for us? Um, thankfully, we're not charging admission, right, to get in the church. So hopefully we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but I think if we're honest, we, we would say, uh, and, and this is what is pretty unique, um, Jesus has shown up, right? He is present in our life, and he is constantly driving things out of our heart, right? He's constantly driving things from us. Uh, one of the things we might get to talk about today um, during main service when we talk about our uh, outreach Bible project trip that we took, we're going to try not to steal anyone's thunder on it, but when we, when we got over there and when we started the work, one of the um, attitudes, one of the sentiments that everybody kind of had in common there was it's, it's, you're not constrained by the busyness of the world, right? We're there to evangelize, and that's it. Our whole day is focused and it's centered around the spreading of the gospel. And so it's a time where when you notice when you, you sit down and you focus and you really dedicate yourself to it, you can do amazing things. You can do wonderful things. Uh, again, we, we are just our group alone, our little group of like eight people, we handed out about 5,000 Bibles in the first day. You know, it's amazing, like spreading the word with a dedicated effort, you can do that. And then the sentiment that, you know, um, Brother David prepared us for, he says, when you get home, you're going to get busy. You're going to find that, um, you know, you're going to find other people that are not as driven towards sharing the gospel uh, as you were here. And you're even going to find that you're not going to be driven in the same way. Like your, your life is going to start pulling at you. And it can be frustrating, right? We have to challenge ourselves and say, what, what are we doing that's more important than the spreading of the gospel? What are we doing that's more important than the worshiping of God? You know, what are we doing that's more important than exalting God above all things? Uh, there has to be a serious evaluation of the way that we're spending the time in our life, right? Um, everybody has the same type of time to spend. Uh, we might have different amounts of it, but time works the same way for all of us, right? Um, how was Jesus able to invest the time? How are these people, the apostles, how are they able to invest the time? Uh, looking back at preachers and evangelists and speakers of old, how are they able to invest the time uh, to really develop the kingdom of God here on earth? Uh, their hearts, lives were centered around Jesus Christ, right? Uh, one of the things, again, that we'll talk about later, and I think this is important, uh, a realization that I had kind of given to me in college that like helped me to better grasp all this 
is, you know, when, when Jesus says, uh, go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. Sure, you've heard this before, but it's not go as a commandment, go and do that. Uh, the word is as you are going, right? As you are going about your life, make, make your life about preaching and, and discipling and leading to baptism to, to others, right? Sur- orient your life around that. And so it's not, um, you know, do I, do I need to quit my job so that I can, you know, spread the gospel more? It's no, spread the gospel while you're at work, right? Um, do I need to take time away from my kids so that I could be a evangel- better evangelist? No, evangelize your children, right? Uh, evangelize through your children. Uh, I have a pastor uh, friend, um, you know, kids are involved in like football and stuff like that. And he says, you know, it used to be frustrating because uh, you know, I, I've kind of expected to go. They have practice all the time. They have you know, these games, and I want to show up, and I want to be there, and I want to be supportive. But you know, I have uh, a schedule that I keep. I have study that I need to do. I have people that are always asking me to come and reach out. And I have thing after thing to do. Uh, and then you realize, like, you know, I'm, when I go to the practice field, I'm sitting next to lost people, right? When I'm in the stands, I'm sitting next to lost people. Uh, this isn't a distraction from the work of Christ. This is the mission field. You know, this is the work that, that I'm doing. And I, I think that's, a, again, just this great reminder for us to have is to try to have that perspective. You know, if Christ came to our church, what would he find to drive out, right? If Christ is present in your life, what is he going to find to drive out? If Christ were present in, his, in your homes, what is he going to find to drive out? And then save him the work. You know, you drive it out. You get rid of it. You know, don't wait for Christ to drive it out violently. You voluntarily give it up. So we continue on. Um, verse number 20 through 25. It says this. And in the morning they passed by. They saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith to him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus said unto him, uh, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou moved, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he, uh, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you ha- have aught against any, that your Father, which also is in heaven, may, pray, uh, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your trespasses. So, as um, Jesus is leaving the temple, uh, we can read here. Uh, it says, before entering the temple, Jesus had stopped by a fig tree for some fruit, but found none. Though it was not the season of the figs, Jesus nonetheless cursed the fig tree to die. Uh, just as a pause, I think that's one of the most interesting parts of this whole story. Like, you know, um, if we went to like an orange tree and it was not in, in season for oranges, like, oh, there's no oranges here, you know, um, what, why are you going to be upset at the tree? But Jesus goes, like, he, he demands fruit at all times. And there's a bit of a parallel for um, the lives that Christians ought to be leading. Uh, we're told to be instant in season and out of season, right? Always ready in season and out of season. Always producing fruit in our life, um, even when it is not convenient for us to do so, right? Uh, even when we would feel like, you know, I just really don't feel like worshiping God. I really don't feel like, you know, being a servant of God. I really don't feel like blessing God um, today. Uh, well, uh, Sadly, God didn't ask, you know, how you're feeling today. Like, this is who you are, and this is your responsibility. But all of that is a a side note. I just think that's a very quirky thing that happens here. So Jesus nonetheless cursed the fig tree to die. After the events of the temple, Jesus and his disciples passed by the same tree. Uh, Only then it was withered and dead. The disciples were astonished, but Jesus reminded them that through faith, prayer, and forgiveness— God will accomplish miraculous things in the life of his children. So uh, we already talked a little bit about um, the prosperity gospel uh, this morning, and uh, the similar mentality is what would be called this word faith movement, right? The idea from passages like this that they use is, um, you know, Jesus says, if you ask and you believe that you will have it, then you will have it, right? As simple as that. 
And so if you desire it, if you want it, if you pray for it and say, God, this is what I'm claiming in faith, right? Um, God, uh, I want a Maserati, and I know that all the Maseratis and all the parking lots are yours, uh, and you can give me a Maserati. Uh, uh, so I believe that you're going to do it, right? Um, amen. And wait for it to happen. Um, is that what Jesus Christ is talking about here? Is that so we all kind of shake our head, you know, no, that, that's silly. Well, then what, what does it mean? Because he does say, you know, pray in faith, and if you ask, you shall receive. So that seems very straightforward. So what does it mean to pray in faith? Faith, you should know. Well, what does it mean to pray in faith? <laughs> okay, so it certainly does mean to believe, right? Uh, but again, if I, if I believe that I'm going to get a Maserati, but we, we certainly see that not happening, right? Um, and um, Right, right. So faith is more than just belief, right? And this is something that we, we try to emphasize again and again. Um, faith is more than just belief. It is an alignment of yourself with God, as, as Chelsea's pointing out for us, right? Um, faith is a dependence on God, is a support on God. And so it's not necessarily like um, praying that God builds bridges where he hasn't made bridges to be laid, but it's recognizing God has already laid the bridge and stepping out on it, right? It's trusting what he has already prepared, what he is already willing to do, where he's already directing. Mm. And so how do you see that as being like the praying in faith and desiring that? Yes, sir. And with with that, like in the spending of our time, I'd also say like that relates to um, those things that we are asking God for and those things that we are praying for is this constant evaluation of, you know, what does God find valuable and praying for those things and desiring those things. Mm. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and so this, uh, one of favorite passages of Scripture, what, Psalm 37, 4, uh, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Uh, again, same principle here. It's this uh, commandment to orient yourself around God. And then once you do, like, God will fulfill your desires because your desires will be his desires, right? Um, the prayer of faith is not a prayer contrary to the will of God, but it's a prayer in alignment to the will of God. Um, so the, the prayer of faith is not just, um, you know, seeing what I want and saying, okay, then I claim that as mine and counting on God to, you know, if you rub the lamp, magic lamp hard enough, the, the genie will show up and grant you your wishes. Uh, but it, it, it is saying, you know, God, what do you desire? And then I'm going to desire those things as well. And I know that you will bring those things to pass. I know that those things are, are true. Um, moving on to our final section here, uh, starting in verse number 27. It says, And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, uh, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So we have like a whole posse showing up to, to challenge Jesus here. And say unto him, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee the authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto him, I will ask of you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say, from heaven, he will say, Why then did ye not believe him? But if we will say, of men... They feared the people, for all men counted John 
uh, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Final paragraph here. It says, when Jesus returned to Jerusalem, he was confronted by the religious leaders that he had offended. They challenged him, asking him what authority he had to drive out the merchants, to teach, and to perform miracles. Rather than answering them, Jesus responds with a question of his own. So Jesus takes the politician approach, right? Let me answer that question with another question. It says, um, under whose authority did John baptize people? The religious leaders were afraid to answer. They knew if they acknowledged John's authority from God, then they couldn't challenge Jesus, the teacher whom John said was greater than himself. However, if the leaders spoke what they really thought, that John had no authority to baptize, then they knew the people would turn on them since the people revered John as a prophet and a martyr. Thus, the leaders were silenced and Jesus refused to answer them. He didn't tell them where his authority came from, what power that he had to do these things. Okay, yeah, so um, perhaps they already knew. And that, that, that's our next question here. Why do you think Jesus refused to answer? Um, what did he accomplish by responding with a question? Right. Right. Yes, sir. I'm going to cheat because I've been back in the class and been studying it all. People already showed it. Mm -hmm. They came to him to give him a sign. I said, I'm not going to give you a sign. <laughs> I've done it three days and three nights. I'm going to go back to the resurrection. It's great, but he already, he's just done a miracle. He just, he's given them proof after proof after proof. They just, they were not going to believe it. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, several things were worth commenting on there. Um, Jeremy, I think you're, you're spot on with what's going on here. You know, Jesus didn't answer them because he didn't need to answer them, right? Um, they, he showed what they were all about, right? He, he showed. These were supposed to be the religious authorities. These were the, supposed to be the people that were making appropriate judgments. Um, the, the, the most miraculous man of, of hundreds of years had come along in the person of John the Baptist, right? One of the most powerful speakers and prophets of the gospel, uh, if anyone should have been able uh, to say, you know, this is a man of God or this is not a man of God, it should have been the scribes and the Pharisees, right? And so these were people that should have been able to make these uh, deliberations and to say, look, we are keepers of the word of God. We commune with God in prayer. We know what God's desires are. Uh, they should have been able to say something about the authority of John, but they couldn't. Not because they didn't know, but because they were afraid of the people, right? They had their ideas about John, and frankly, they were wrong ideas, but they were afraid to express even what they believed because they were afraid of the people. And these, these are people who um, are not authorities at all, right? You know, they're, they're malleable, they're shiftable. They'll go um, whatever the path of least resistance is in order to accomplish what their goals are. And so Christ says, um, you know, basically he's saying, you think you're authorities, but you, you, you can't even say the difficult things with authority. You, you teach with no authority. You're spineless is, is essentially what he's showing here. And then as Jamie brought up, um, they, they've already sent people to ask, you know, well, show us a sign. I'm not going to show you a sign. Okay, well, tell us whose authority that you're doing this under. I'm not going to tell you whose authority I'm doing this under. Uh, you know, um, he could have, right? He, he, when they asked for a, t a sign, he could have done a wonderful work right there. Um, when they challenged his authority, he could have, you know, opened up the, the, the windows of heaven and say, God, uh, if you could, please tell these people, uh, you know, who I am. Like, he could have done that. Those things could have happened. Um, but it's interesting that Jesus says, uh, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to answer you because it's, it's not going to profit anything, right? You've already shown what your heart is, is to be. Um, there's a time when I was younger when I would accept any challenge, right? Uh, any time someone wanted to spar or debate or to, to get into it. Uh, and I remember a church service where I had a gentleman uh, just kind of going back with me. Uh, I think it was a Wednesday night service and just talking about things in the Bible. And honestly, we spent an hour and a half just going back and forth. 
Um, and thankfully, it was like literally just a couple people that were there. I wasn't keeping like 50 people, uh, but it was just like a little uh, a family that was there. And it was just an hour and a half of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And um, there came a point where like this, this isn't profitable, right? Uh, they're, they're, we're not gaining anything here. We're not advancing anything here. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult, but there are times where it is not profitable to 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 answer in this way, right? Uh, Jesus said there is there's something greater than me just telling you here's another sign and you rejecting the sign as you've always done. Here's the authority that I'm teaching under, as though you don't know who I've claimed to be, as though you don't know what I've claimed to do. Instead, he says, look, this is the real heart of the issue, right? Um, we're not going to debate these 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 things over and over again. Here's the real heart of the issue. The real heart of the issue is you guys are people pleasers. You know, you're not followers of God. You're followers of man. You're followers of your pocketbooks. And until you resolve that, I have nothing to say to you, right? And until you can repent of that, I have nothing to offer you. Uh, how, how astounding is that? But it is true to the gospel, right? Um, you cannot be, uh, you, you cannot receive the gospel while still being a lover of sin. There must be a repentance, a turning away to say, you know, God, I want to turn away from sin and turn unto you and to put my trust into you and put my faith into you. Uh, again, it's not saying that we are perfected before and then we receive the gospel, but there's a heart's change from the way that we are living, from the people that we are. There is a repentance uh, a change of mind of who Christ is and who we are that must take place. And until that happens, um, all the, the, the teaching in the world is just words to this. You have to get to the real heart of the issue. And so, um, you know, those who've been in, our, in, in the class in the back, one of the things we've noticed is uh, each of the chapters of Mark seem to be gathered around a theme, right? There's a central theme. And the central theme of this chapter really does seem to be this authority of Christ, right? Um, he comes into Jerusalem as a king, and people are recognizing his authority, but not truly surrendering it, right? They want him to use his authority to do what they want, which means they want his authority to be under their authority, not to be subjected to his authority. And then we see the um, incident where the temple, where he goes and he drives out, um, and he says, you know, this, this is inappropriate, right? The authority of God says what you're doing here is wrong, and under submission to that authority, I'm going to do something that, frankly, isn't appreciated by, by some of the people around here, but it is necessary to do. And then we have the moment with the fig tree, and he says, uh, look, if you pray in faith, if you pray in the authority of God, um, miraculous things will, wonder, will happen, right? You will speak and it will happen. You know, that's an authority as believers that we can live in. We can live in the authority of God. We can speak with the authority of God if we align ourselves with the desires of God through faith. And then lastly, he, he is challenged on his authority. And he says, I have the authority not to tell you by what authority I do these things. You don't understand anything about authority because you claim to be authorities, but you yourself are under the thumb of the popularity of the people, right? Of the opinion of the people. So, uh, you know, I joked about Jesus taking the politician answer, um, but the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were um, the, the politician mentality, right? Uh, we'll be whatever you want us to be. Just keep our pocketbooks full, right? Um, and so, again, this whole passage revolves around the authority of Jesus Christ in this life. And it's something that we truly have to recognize if we're going to live in accordance, live in the blessing of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, we, we look at this passage and uh, several things in it make our heart break. Several things um, you know, challenge us to repentance and several things in it uh, give us joy and give us hope, Lord. Uh, God, help us to be a people that are uh, fully surrendered unto your authority, that we don't go to you uh, asking you to use your power and your ability, your authority on this earth to accomplish what our desire is, but rather that we submit unto what your will for our life is. We submit unto the salvation and the joy that you are bringing, trusting that you know best. God, help us to be people that um, pray in the authority of God, that, uh, again, are so aligned to his will that when we pray, um, uh, what we pray for comes to pass because we know it is what you desire to come to pass. God, help us to be people to recognize 
Um, we, we don't always have to answer every challenge that is given to us, but rather to be insightful enough to see uh, the real issues that need to be resolved. Uh, again, the real challenge of authority to God uh, as the King and the Lord of our life. God, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.